Hey, my name is Bailey, founder of Black Beak, and today we're joined by some super awesome individuals. We got James, Jonas, and Craig, uh, and we got a super cool video. Today we're diving deep into the most complex Wiz project that exists to this date of this recording. Um, it's We dive really deep, we go into how we built it in Wiz, how we built it in Xana, how we conceptualized it. So grab a snack, stick around, um, it's gonna be a good one. So let's start just introductions. I'll introduce myself and then pass off to Jonas and we'll go around the table. Um, my name is Bailey, founder of Black Peak, um, aspiring to be the number one Wiz Webflow agency. And um, yeah, excited to be here. Excited to show you guys what we've built. Um, it's it's really, 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 really neat. Jonas, I'll pass off to you. I'm Jonas, uh, creator of Wiz. So I, I built the, uh, I, I built, initially built the product. And uh, now at FinSuite, I'm responsible basically for uh, building all your wishes and uh, making it really uh, the best tool for you to build web applications with Webflow. So um, yeah, that's uh, that's all you need to know about me and this call. Um, great. Maybe I will pass it on to Craig. Hi guys, I'm Craig. I'm the head of product at August. Uh, we'll get a little bit more into what August does in a little bit, but uh, ultimately I've had the pleasure of working with these uh Gentlemen, for the last couple of months, building what turned out to be quite a complex, but uh, yeah, super cool project. Uh, well, finally, uh, I'm James. I've been working as a developer for Blackbeak for almost over a year now. So I've been working with, well, Webflow, then Sano, and, well, and Weeks, obviously. Awesome. Good stuff. That's an understatement, James. You've been doing crazy stuff in Sano. It's, it's yeah, it's insane. Um, Cool. So let's let's dive right in, Craig. What does August do? Um, just give us a quick overview. What does August do? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, in a nutshell, we're a holiday home co-ownership platform. Um, but really, uh, we seek to solve kind of three of the main problems that you might uh, see or think about when owning a holiday home in the traditional sort of sense. So that's just you owning a holiday home all by yourself. And really, that's the fact that you don't actually use it all the time because by definition, you just use it on holiday. Um, you don't always want to go on holiday to the same place. So if you buy a home, you're kind of stuck in that one place. Uh, and then it can also be difficult to actually go through the whole purchasing process and maintain it when you're not there in person. Um, and particularly for those sort of in Europe, if that's in a different country that may speak a different language. So really what we do is we have a very innovative model that solves all three of those. And we do that by rather than having one house for one family, we share five homes between 21 families. And so that means you get five homes in five different countries, um, some for summer, some for winter. You share them with 21 other families, which means everybody gets enough time in the year, but only as much as they would need to actually go on holiday so that the home is not sitting empty for the rest of the time. And then August really facilitates that entire journey. So we support with all the legal and due diligence side of things. And then we fully maintain that property so that all you guys have to do, or all our customers have to do is turn up and, and enjoy their holiday. Mm -hmm. And it's really neat because at the end, the user is actually buying a portion of this, this collection of properties, right? They're buying a share into the company, which is distributed by 21 shares. And those 21 shares own um, one twenty-first of each property, essentially. Um, yeah, so exactly. I think timeshares were a big thing over here that particularly in the UK got a very bad name because you don't actually own anything as such. So we've kind of flipped that on its head. All five properties go into a company. Like you say, that company is owned not by us at all, but by the, by the 21 families. Yeah. And so what you had before, um, that's a good segue to the next section of what August was using before um, was a tool to facilitate that booking process because while you don't own the properties, you still have to manage and facilitate um, the process of people, individuals booking those properties. Yeah, exactly. So because there's 21 different families, we have a pretty um, innovative way in which we distribute sort of time to them. And so it's a points-based system, essentially. They get a certain number of points per year and they redeem them. Uh, a peak period is going to be more points than an off-peak period. Um, but really, there's a whole bunch of rules and logic and conditionals uh, around that that we have to account for. So whilst it, you know you are just booking a property, much like you would with Airbnb or any other site, Expedia, 
there's a whole lot more logic under the hood that we really needed to build in. And, and previously we'd done this using sort of JavaScript and, you know, a very sort of custom bespoke development working with a, an offshore developer. Um, but ultimately he was the only one that knew anything about that system. Um, and so there was a big kind of key person risk there where actually we had nobody in house with the technical capabilities to, um, you know, do anything with that system. And so we were very dependent on, uh, on him. Yeah, which is why I led you to this no code kind of route with Wiz and Xano. But I want to dive in a bit more about the tech stack you're using in the back end there. Can you explain a bit more about what was the, the base system built on? What was it like managing it? The previous system? Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, again, I we didn't have a whole lot of visibility into it, which was part of the, the problem. So it was uh, it was run off an on-prem server that he you know, had himself in, in, uh, he was based in Romania. So we didn't have any access to that because it wasn't cloud-based. Um, again, everything was written in, uh, various sort of JavaScript languages. So, uh, you know, I couldn't go in and, and change even basic things. I didn't have access to the SQL database, which is what we ran everything off of as well. Um, so really just, yeah, not a lot of, uh, you know, visibility into the system and therefore not much flexibility for us. Um, so let's, let's dive in a bit. Um, <clears throat> Let's dive in a bit about what was built from a high level. So this whole project took us probably about, we started first started talking, I guess, early August. I think it took us about a month, a month and a half to fully scope everything out and go around due diligence. Um, there was a lot of calls. And this is uh, one of the bigger things with enterprise projects and Wiz. Is scoping is super, super important. I guess it's important for smaller projects, but even more so for projects of this magnitude. Um, there are definitely points that, um, like, I think we could have scoped even further now that looking back on it. Um, but we used Fake Jam to scope everything out, going over different points in the user's journey of where they're starting from, from users just logging onto the platform and being onboarded to users booking properties. And then what happens after a user books a property? Once we have those different kind of tranches, then we go in and figure out what are some different functions in Xana that we would have to run to make those functions and make those, uh, to create those functions and, and enable them. Um, from there, <clears throat> let's see here, referencing my notes. From there, just going over to rough database structures, testing a lot in Xano and doing some initial testing. And um, after that, coming up with a Google spreadsheet, which I think probably had at least like 70, 60 line items. Right, correct me if I'm wrong. And then once we looked at that, we just finagled that even more, updated that a bit, you know, refined the scope, and uh, and went from there straight into Figma develop Figma design, then Webflow development, then Wiz development, then Xano development. So there is a, a lot taken here. Well, I will say with be with this kind of project, you know, enterprise project for Webflow development, it's it's not like a regular website. Definitely, it's, it's you know, you need to scope everything from creating, as you said, you know, all the structure of the user flow that they are going to have in the platform and thinking how much time is going to take you to create these functions in, in this platform of Sano that we're using. Uh, so yeah, there is, there is a ton of stuff that needs to be scoped, you know. I can just underline uh, what, what you just said, Bailey. I think scoping is very important for voice projects when you're dealing with client work in general. Um, when you're on a personal project, it might not be so important to really map out everything from the beginning. But uh, when you're on a client project, you yeah you, you will want to probably um, give a give an estimation of what it will cost in the beginning, and this estimation can be um, yeah it, it's just different to get to this estimation with web applications than with uh, traditional websites, which probably maybe already have a mock-up and which you already maybe have built twenty of and know exactly how long it takes you to build each section. Um, yeah, and in, in web applications, it can be diff different. Like in general, you can deal with more complex uh, bugs uh, or just uh, technical issues you find along the way or or difficulties. Mm -hmm. And um, it might sometimes, like every developer probably you will um, can tell you like as long as possible about it. There are some questions which are actually super easy to solve, but will still take you hours. Um, so yeah, just Calculate that in and don't undercalculate when you're building for clients um, is, I think, the biggest advice I can, I can give out to, um, yeah, new new WIS developers and in general also even code developers who are taking on client projects. 
Yeah. Just to reiterate that contingency, um, I think all that, Jonas, what you said wraps into contingency, which is crucial for projects like this. Um, there are multiple times where we're building out Xano functions and we didn't realize at the start how complex this function was actually going to be. And then James messages me on Slack. He's like, this was a hundred step function. And we look at it and I'm like, oh my God, it was, it's, it's crazy complex. So definitely do your due diligence at the beginning and plan for a lot of contingency and plan. If you think it's going to be, you know, a month, double it, right? Um, set, set your expectations far and wide and um, yeah, don't, uh, don't over promise. That's for sure. So what we built in Wiz was the whole booking tool. Users uh, can sign up, but only if they have an account, they can't actually, my apologies, they can't sign up, but users can log in from an account created by them by August. They can see their progress um, along the way of their collection and their property. So if they join a new collection and that property is still getting renovated, they'll see the status of that. There's form functionality where users can talk to different individuals and share their experiences at these properties. Say one of them found a really cool restaurant down there from a property. They can share that in the form and share images there. There's liking functionality, comment functionality, full-fledged form with filtering. There is the booking tool, obviously, um, but it's not just a booking tool. It's not just, you know, you book a property and that's it. You select, there's actually two ways to do it. We did a quick booking method and a slow booking method per se. Um, and there's different ways. So say you have more flexibility. You notice if you go to airline websites, you can kind of, there's a, there might be a, a toggle that says I'm flexible and you can, you know, you can be flexible with your dates there. So we have that sort of method where user enters in their month and their year, and it shows them all dates available for all properties in their collection. Or there's another method, uh, the slow method, where they can go into a specific property and then view dates available to that specific, or sorry, go into a specific collection, view properties available to that specific collection um, on a month and year basis. So it's a more refined way of viewing uh, available properties. Um, rather than the quick booking method where it shows you all collections and all properties. Um, with that being said, um, you can book a property. One thing you can do on this booking page is you can see if a property is already booked. And if it is already booked, you can join the wait list. This was a really interesting function to build out. Um, it was a lot more difficult than we thought it was at, fir at first. But essentially, there's a little symbol, and we'll share screen and we'll show everything. But there's a little symbol that shows how many users are on the waitlist. And if you would join the waitlist, you can do that. That's fine. But it doesn't remove any of your tokens. And this is a good segue into the tokenization of this whole platform is because even though a user has uh, purchased a share into this collection, they can't just book the properties for free. There has to be a way to regulate the amount of times a user can stay at these properties to make sure all users get a fair share at these properties. And so August has a token system and they distribute tokens on a quarterly basis. Is that correct, August? Or Craig? Yeah, roughly, yeah. <laughs> okay. And so they distribute tokens on a, uh, on a you know, frequent cadence, I'll say. And um, those tokens, you know, it's, it, I, we saw the site. It's kind of like Boxing Day almost. People scrambling to get to the site, booking as fast as they can. Um, I think we had almost 30,000 API calls or 20,000 API calls in that one day or the span of two days or so. <laughs> so yeah, it's a bit like uh, Black Friday rolled in with a sort of concert ticket launch or something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. So that was fun. But Xano handled it fine. You know, Wiz handled it fine. Um, in terms of performance and like server load issues, there were there were none with that. It was completely good, which was um, very exciting to see. Xano can handle quite a lot of load. Um, that we're only on the smaller launch plan here, and so um, Xano has multiple plans above that, which can even handle that. We did build an integration as well, right, with Zero. Um, so I guess it shows that you know integrations are very possible, and essentially that allows us to um, once somebody's finished their stay. Uh, we build them for the cleaning of the property. Uh, and so that allows invoices to flow into the platform automatically from zero. Um, and then they can open the invoice and pay it with, within the platform as well. So uh, sort of a third party integration there as well. Yeah, exactly. And then some other integrations as well. Um, we had a situation where we needed to filter uh, CMS items from Webflow based off of what user was logged in, what collection they had access to. And so for this, we built an external API call to Webflow, got all the posts 
uh, with a specific ID, made sure they matched the user's ID and displayed that on Wiz. Um, that was a lot more complex than I thought it was going to be as well. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and then lastly, versioning control in Xano. This was a really, really useful one for us because of the size of the project and because of the amount of frequent updates we we're making, we utilized versioning control in Xano, which allows us to have a production database as well as a test database um, and API branching. And so if me and James are working on new functions, they are not public yet. We can build them on V12 and have V11 be public and then push everything to V12 once we're ready to go there. It's pretty important uh, for you know, a, project, a project of this magnitude to have um you know, these kind of branches for the API calls because you cannot break down like a life site. So it's, it's you need to be really careful with that because, you know, there you have users logging in, trying to book properties, so you cannot mess that up. All right. So when you join the, uh, the dashboard here, this is what you're looking at. We have a, a Xano call that is, I'm just going to open up the chat as well. Sorry, one second. There we go. So when you join the website, this is your dashboard that you see. This image here gets a random image from any property in a collection that you own. We can see points that we have here. And this is quite a complex situation, the points, because the points have validity terms as well. Um, they're not just willy-nilly 100 points here and there. It's, you know, you have deadlines of when you can spend these points, as well as date ranges of when these points are valid from. Scrolling down, you can see, you know, good morning, Bailey. I have the quick booking method here where I can select a month, select a year, and then search properties available to me um, within collections that I own. And then I can see my upcoming stays. You can see, you know, I got a stay coming up January 28th. I wish I was going to Mallorca, but, you know, this is a test site, so we're not. Um, we can see any sort of details. I can view or edit this booking. Um, we've implemented Spline.js here. So we can see, you know, I can go back and forth on the slider. And then down here, we can see the collections I have access to. Um, got some really gorgeous properties. This, this imagery is fantastic. I love it. Um, we can scroll up and say, I want to view City Collection 01. We can load that. And there it is, City Collection 01. Ticket to Collection 02, I could do that. And there we go. So we can see all the different collections I have access to. And then down here is the Webflow CMS filtering by specific collection ID. Um, and this is a really fun one. That's uh, that's the one I think people will really, really want to hear about. Um, rem reminders, to, uh, now that we're looking at the dashboard, if you have any questions about this project specifically, you'd love to see them in the questions and answers here. Um, I know I some have a lot of questions, questions, actually. Yes, yes. Um, are those, like all those upcoming stays, for example, that you see and all the, all the properties in the collection, are they own, all loaded by WIST or is it the static uh, side? These are all dynamic. Everything here is dynamic. So you basically were able to, to build this functionality um, and the slider and uh, load the data for the for the like, load the correct data for the user in basically and display yeah. it to him. Yeah, exactly. So this is all coming through the authentication call. And what happens here is this is just one static item in Webflow. And then you have your basic Splat.js integration. And then we duplicate the item for the amount of items there are. And then we have a Boolean. So we use an add-on in Xano. And we have a Boolean that says, is this stay waitlisted? And if it is, then in Wiz, we set custom CSS classes to show the waitlisted state that you can see here. Um, so that's kind, of how, that's kind of how we had differentiating items inside of one array, which was really uh, an interesting. Yeah, it's, it's quite useful, actually, when you get to utilize it. Where do you see, well, um, the Wiz API call to just wait, you know, for Wiz to load the elements and then load the library, the Splat.js library? Yeah. yeah, yeah, using Wiz JavaScript to wait for Wiz to load, correct? Yes. Yeah. Well, let's dive in. So let's say I want to book for February 2023. I'll click search. It's going to load everything. And uh, we do have some caching going on here, but it takes about three or four seconds just because I myself have four collections. 99% of users have about one collection. I'd say maybe 90% of users have one collection. Craig's nodding to that. Um, and so we can go down here and we can see there's a bit of a legend here. You can see waitlist is this green circle. Uh, selected is this orange. So if I select one, it's going to go orange. Um, green is my current booking. And then this gray is booked. And so we can see these are all booked already. Um, but they don't have a wait list. So I mean, there's only one person that's booked them. So I can go down to Tuscany, uh, February 4th to 11th, select that. And then I can book that. 
And then notice there's zero points. So the reason these are all zero points is because we're within 30 days of the date happening. So it's, um, I'm not sure what you would call that, Craig, but. Um, well, the last minute stay. So we try and, uh, yeah, if people want to have a spontaneous holiday, then they they don't have to pay any points for it. Um, and yeah, I guess there's a conditional there, right? Because you guys have to reset the points to zero uh, based on that 30 day period. Exactly, exactly. So again, 30, within 30 days, um, there's a, um, last minute stay there. Correct. Um, and people are missing in chat. It's spli.js. Spli.js is what we used. Yeah. So yeah, now that I booked that property, I view the details here. It's going to take me to the booking review page and we can see I'm going to Tuscany, my check-in date, February 4th, checkout time. And we have some customizable properties here. And so what we can see is we can see if, uh, you know, say you have a flight coming in, but it's not going to make it till the 5th on like, you know, 6 a.m. or so instead of the 4th. You can say uh, September 5th is going to be my check-in day or February 5th will be my check-in date um, at, you know, at 6 a.m. Um, and then, you know, there's going to be four guests or so, and you can enter in your flight number of whatever, and then I can update this booking. And as you saw, it saved all that data there. And that's that. So that is then stored in the Xamarin database and Craig and his team can go and view that, say they want, you know, a customer reaches out via the live chat. They have some changes they want to make, or they just want to make sure they confirmed it. Craig can, uh, Craig has visibility over all of that in the database. Unlike before where you didn't even have access to the MySQL database. Correct. Wow. So, um, okay. So that's all good to go now. So what I can do, James, let's do a bit of a test. Can you book a property? Let me know what property you're going to book. I'm going to join the wait list of that property. Let's okay. A live, uh, a live test here. Uh, do you have access to the CD collection? Um, I do. Okay. I will go to uh, Mallorca. I'm going to book uh, March 4th to 11th. It's a full week. Uh, but yeah, wait, I just booked that. Can you refresh the page now? Yeah. 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 You can see it right there that I just booked it from March 4th to 11th. Yeah. Yeah. March 4th to 11th. Yeah. Then you yeah. can book now. Yeah. So we can see um, this is the slow booking method that we're looking at here. So we see the one specific property. There would be other images, but this isn't staging. We don't have those other images. And if I scroll down, we have two different options. We have half weeks and full weeks. Um, we can book either in sets of half weeks or sets of full weeks. There are no custom dates we can do. And before I book this property with that James has booked already, I want to discuss a bit about how this calendar idea came to fruition because this isn't typically how you would book. I mean, if you go to Airbnb, any, any booking site, typically you have a JavaScript calendar that opens up and you select your start date, you select your end date, and it's a very custom specific set of dates, right? And they typically bill you by the date. But in this situation, we're, bit, or, um, we're booking by half week or a full week. And that was quite, quite something to, to think of during the conceptualizing of this. Craig, why, why are we doing half weeks and full weeks? Uh, I mean, the reason is so that we we can kind of standardize the check in and check out, so that we you know can have a change of a day where we clean the properties. That's the logistical reason. And then, yeah, half weeks is so that people can have kind of long weekends um, or, or center their stay around the weekend, as opposed to sort of going Saturday to Saturday. Yeah, and when I click one of these properties, there's a lot of conditionals that happen as well. Can we touch on that, Craig? Yeah, so there's multiple things, I guess, because if you think about, um, you know, if a full week is booked, you need to block out both of the respective half weeks because you can't have somebody booking a half week when the, you know, the full week's been booked. So we had a lot of, uh, I guess there's a lot of conditionals there. And then there's also conditionals. I don't know. You tell me where are the other conditionals you built it, Bailey? Uh, so, I mean, you have a ski season conditional. Uh, of course, all the rules. Um, yeah, so, I mean, you have, yeah, multiple booking rules as well, which... I guess, happen when you actually click the book now button. Uh, but there's several, four or five different uh, checks or criteria that the booking must meet uh, before it will actually accept that booking. And again, that's just so there's fair use across different uh, customers and that somebody's not getting Christmas every year in, in the same property. On my screen here, these this is the function that we're using in Xano to show everything, uh, all the rules that we check through. So we see we have about... Um, one, two, three, four, 
rules in this function alone um, that we check through. So you can see rule cannot book in the past. Um, so this is checking to see if there'll be a start date is in the past. Uh, we have a rule only one holiday booking per year. So we have a Boolean in the database that checks to see if the booking is a holiday booking. And then we check to see if a user has, has created more than one of these uh, or check to see if a user has created one. And if they have, then we don't allow a second one to be created. Same thing with the ski season. And then obviously uh, they cannot book the same property or same week in two properties because they would overlap there. So we have a, lot, a couple more functions. I'm not quite sure where they are, um, but these are just a couple of them here. And so going back to August here. Um, so James booked a full week, March 4th to 11th. So I'm going to book yeah. this and it's going to say, great, you've been added to the wait list in number one position. Check, so now James. Check, check your email first so you can see uh, you have received that. We are sure. For sure. I'll yeah, open up sorry. my email. We're not only as well doing this, you know, we're as well using uh, SendGrid to send notifications, you know, for booking cancellations. Uh, when you go to the waitlist, when you have uh, a pending uh, waitlist booking to confirm, because when I'm when I'm going to cancel my booking, Bill is going to receive a notification to confirm his waitlist booking. You can see here's the email. You're on the MyRecar waitlist. I'm in position one, and there's some information about how the waitlist works. And so we'll wait for the email to say I'm going to Mallorca. Yeah, I will, I will cancel now, okay. Okay. Quick question so, here. Uh, I think also from the audience, um, how is email connected to WIST or Xano? Yeah, so we're using SendGrid's integration, uh, SendGrid Dynamic Send to send over that information. And that's an um, integration that Xano is offering, right? Correct, that's an integration in Xano. And so they have a marketplace component for that. So it's actually quite easy to integrate. Um, and yeah, SendGrid Dynamic Send is what we're using for this. And, and SendGrid, um, for your information, is a, a transactional email sending provider. So you can basically connect your own domain, your own email accounts, and uh, then SendGrid will take care of sending those out with some um, customizable information. You, of course, like can completely customize the template, and you can also uh, pass down parameters for the templates. So pass down like the name of the user or the email address, of course, um, to customize those. Exactly. And as you can see on my screen here, here it is. Your waitlist has become available. Um, you're going on Mallorca on this date and I can accept or decline. And look at this image. Like this is, wow. Yeah, no. <laughs> that's, cra uh, that's crazy. And it's dynamic. <laughs> that is true. As Jonas said, definitely I will say SendGrid is the way to go for, I will say, email notification as well. We not for this platform, but we're using as well SendGrid for the reset password setup as well uh, inside, you know, in, for other for their products as well. So, yeah. Yeah. So now let's go and accept or decline this. The user, yes. when they get a notification, the user uh, has 24 hours to confirm that booking. If those, if, if the user doesn't accept the, you know, the, 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 doesn't confirm the booking in 24 hours, the next one receive a notification. So that's a function that is running in the background in Sano that is, you know, um, it's kind of complex too, you know, it deletes after 24 hours, it deletes the, the, the Willis booking that the user has and as well, it notifies the next one. So it's, it's yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty good. We'll dive into that, James. I'll share my screen after this and you can explain us how that works. So here we are, I can confirm or decline my booking. I click confirm my booking and there it is. I can go back to my dashboard. And now it's the 4th to 11th of Mallorca. We can go down here, 4th to 11th, and there it is. It's white. I'm booked. I'm going to Mallorca. And James, you're paying for my flight. Um, <laughs> there we go. Uh, I think for mine, just amazing work. I mean, it all comes together hand in hand. I know the backend work on this project was really complex. Um, of course, with as well, but uh, backend especially, all the booking rules you have, all the special, um, yeah, just the edge cases you need to, to take in mind and consider when building this project. Uh, and I think it's, it's quite a lot. Um, it's, so that's really impressive to see. And uh, yeah, congratulations again on uh, you guys building this project out and building all the functionality together, even with email notifications and uh, just everything really a fully fledged web application needs. And uh, yeah, it, it's a really complex one. So uh, congratulations. I know it was not an easy task and, uh, but yeah, just ha really happy to see it uh, worked out. Yeah, thank you. 
So yeah, I mean, taking a look here, we got a couple databases, just a, just a few. Um, <clears throat> Craig or uh, James, do you want to speak to this at all? We have, you know, uh, I will say this starts from the beginning. You know, you need to definitely in the scope of the project, you need to know how many tables you're going to be all the connection between tables. This is, uh, yeah, the base of everything to build as well the front end. So I will say, yeah, we have, well, we have users, bookings, availabilities, you know, as well, we have a community page where you have comments, uh, posts. So yeah, I will say, uh, just talking about in general of, of this, this this needs to be part of the scope, you know, before you start the project, you need to know how many tables you're going to be, all the connections and how much time it's going to take you to fill all these functions that connects yeah. and, you know, it's, yeah. So let's take a look at the availabilities here. So we mentioned before that we are using half weeks and full weeks here. So this database here has 1900 records. <laughs> These are all availabilities from, I believe, 2022 all the way to almost the end of 2023. If that's there's correct, Craig. Yeah, there's a few early ones, but mostly that, yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that we had to do as well, we had to import all of the past bookings from the old system to the new system, um, which was a feat in itself to try and do that. But it, it worked, worked out at the end. And so if you can see, we are table referencing the properties here. And then we have the booking ID when it becomes booked. The point cost is individual for every single booking. Every single booking has its own cost. That's That was something that's quite... Um, it's quite interesting. Is booked Boolean, the start end date is full week, is holiday and is season, season, and we're using those to check conditionals when they book. Bookings here stores all of the user's bookings and some of the data is disconnected just because of testing. So I'm gonna go down over to the bottom and we can see here are the books. So, or here are the bookings we made today. So James booked Mallorca. And then he canceled it. So it has a deleted date. So I want to stress this. I, I can't stress this enough. With this sort of system and with this sort of database, archiving is critical, right? You don't want to delete. You want to just hide it, right? And then maybe after a year or two years, if you want to delete it to clean up your database, sure, delete it. But archiving is critical. And just data and auditing is super, super important. And so... Instead of, instead of just deleting it, we're setting a deleted date, then using that to determine whether we show it or not. We can see this is connected to a certain availability. We can see its total cost. And here is the custom data here, the raw date and time that we are showing here. And so if I go back to page 31, we can see, if you recall, I entered in that custom date here of the arrival date and the flight number, it is all there. Um, other than that, database wise, let's see what we got here. We have the collections, of course, the different property collections and the properties within those collections, which I can see here. And there's no booking information here, right? All we're doing is the booking and the availabilities have their own databases. And then we're table referencing this database here. So it's pretty interesting. Um, other than that, the waitlist, so users that are on the waitlist or users that were on the waitlist here. Um, let's take a look. Different um, tokens, where are they here? Different users. Users is in. I'm trying to find it. What are you looking for? Points. Points. Yeah, so this is where we're showing the points as well. We have the valid, uh, the valid date range of point here, and then the collection ID. Why we build the functions inside Sano? Because you know we're it's such a complex logic that is behind that that it, it could be it, it, it would be hard to build all of that logic inside Wiz directly. Um, yeah, and it would also not be safe actually. Um, so you probably want to have those booking rules. You want to be really sure that they are being enforced, and. Um, in order to to be sure of that, you need to handle it in the back end um, behind the authentication wall. And uh, basically, so that you cannot just send manipulated parameters to the back end and then get your booking done. Uh, because this is like a typical attack vectors hackers would do with your web applications. They would just try to modify the actual request parameters that are going out from the request in the browser to the server. And uh, 
yeah, those those request parameters are actually very easy, very very easy to tamper with. Um, so you will want to validate everything that's critical for your application in the backend. What we're looking on my screen here, this is the cancel booking API call, and we, as you can see, we're accepting the booking ID, um, and then we're ensuring that the user is authenticated. And then after we do that, we have a lot of functions and a lot of conditionals going through the cancel booking API call. It doesn't stop. It's still, it's still, it's still going. There it is. Um, yeah. There's a lot of information here, and this is a lot larger than we thought it was going to be. James, you want to explain? Maybe yeah, not, so you know, completely deep and on a high level how this works. So I will say, uh, you, you, we just need to check stuff, right? We we need to check if it's a waitlist booking that is being deleted. We need to know if it's a uh, a real a real booking, you know, uh, that is being deleted. We need to know. Um, uh, how many points it costs the user because if it's a wait list it, it costs them zero so they should get uh zero points back if it's a book uh, if it's a, an availability that is booked they they need to get the amount of points that it, that it costs them um yeah well we need to notify the next user that is in the wait list we yeah there is we just need to yeah check stuff it's just um you know um I will say Sano is, is extremely powerful for this kind of stuff. It's it's not what you can do with Sano. Um, yeah, and the learning curve with Sano is you know it's not that it's not that easy, but I will say is I will say it's it's you know it's it's the best tool right now for no code backend at, at, at this point. Um, How long have you been working with Sano? Um, yeah, I will say uh, well from from. From the start on August, definitely. Uh, yeah, it's been just four months and I'm able already to build these kind of functions. So it's yeah. like the learning curve is not, it's not that bad, but yeah, you know, I think there is no, there is no better way to learn something than to have the pressure, you know, of, of, of doing something, <laughs> <laughs> right? We're like, using, kind of we were using Xana. I was using Xana all the way back when Wizd V1 was still around and Jonas mm -hmm. was the first one introduced yeah, me to Xana. Yeah, I remember that. And so... I remember I was still using Airtable. Jonas was like, you got to use Xano as the way to go. And so I probably used Xano back from 20, early 2021, if not early 2020, probably early 2020, actually. I think, Bailey, you were the first one to create some tutorials on Xano, right? For Wizd and Xano, yes. like more than a year ago, I think. Um, so I don't know, are they, are, those, are they still alive, actually? They are still live. They're on our site on good old V1 of Wiz. Um, they are. So thanks for watching. Check out FinSuite Plus for other live videos like this one. And also take a look at the Black Peak Office Hours, twice weekly free Wiz support on live calls. We'll see you in the next one.